Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar series. Today we're going to meet and talk with Graham Bass, children's book author and illustrator, all about his creative process, his travels, and lots of other things as well. Let's meet Graham. Thanks for giving us your time today. Pleasure. Uh, let's start with the background, um, just so everyone can, uh, I guess, find out a little bit about where it all began, where it all, where it all started. Um, you've got a lot of different interests, uh, drawing, music, creative writing, um, even model making as part of the process, um, animation, education later on. But um, I think as a a strong music uh, interest and involvement at the beginning. Yeah, well, that was the, the big one for me, was deciding which was going to be art or music. For, for, as a little kid, and you know, for the longest time, I was always going to be, I was going to be an artist. But when I discovered music in my, in my teenage and early 20s, uh, I was just drawn to that instead. And for a long time, I thought I was going to just try and carve a, a career in, in the, so the rock scene in, in, in Melbourne. It didn't, didn't work out, <laughs> thankfully. Um, and then I sort of skewed back to my training, which was, was art. Um, and for a long time, uh, I just, I had, I had no interest in writing. I mean, if I wrote, a, I wrote a book, it was only so I could do the artwork. And it was only later that I started to actually enjoy the, the writing part of it as well as a, as a creative uh, enterprise. So I still, you know, blend all, all, all three of those, you know, the writing, the artwork and the music. Um, and it's, it's, been, it's been fantastic for the last I don't know, 35 years being able to, you know, dip into each of those. So what influenced the music and, uh, and art in the first place? Was that like from school or was it um, parents' influence or was it just something you picked up? Uh, interesting. My, my mum and dad, um, uh, you know, they always assured me, they always read me stories when I was a little, you know, kid in, in, uh, in you know, for going to bed. But all I can remember was, was Dad bringing in the old record player, you know, glorious mono record player into the, into the bedroom so my brother and I could go to sleep listening to music. And it was classical music, typically, you know, Sibelius, Dvorak, Mendelssohn, Brahms, people like that. And so I grew up with, with a love of, of classical music. Uh, I didn't have anything like the skills to actually play that kind of music. And everything that I've ever done, I've always been just self-taught, uh, which is kind of, a, in the end, probably why it didn't go any further. I didn't really have the skill set. Uh, in contrast with the art, um, I actually went to Swinburne and, and did a, the graphic design course there, as it was called in the day. And it was incredibly important because it did actually teach me some real skills to apply to, uh, you know, I suppose, some level of innate, innate talent I actually then back that up with knowledge. Yeah, and it's interesting that, that it was classical music that you were hearing because I wonder if that might have um, developed a love for detail, uh, which yeah. can then translate back into the uh, imagery. No, you're absolutely right. Um, I think I've, I've always been obsessed with detail and did that. I, I, even in the, in the other sorts of music, you know, not classical music, but you know, I suppose pop culture music, it's, I'm always uh, attracted to you know, complexity and, and you know, interwoving of things. Um, so uh, I, I guess I've, in some ways I've, I've tried to get over that in my career. I mean, in a book like Animalia, for instance, every corner of every page was just packed with stuff. It was kind of like the concept, I suppose. But even beyond that into other titles, I was still just jamming art, you know, detail and detail and detail. Until, actually it was, I, I started suddenly thinking, well, maybe one of these books could be a film. Because I, I, had, I had an amazing experience in America where, you know, I was sort of courted by Hollywood for a while. And I began to think in filmic terms. And of course in film, 
it's very different, big, wide open space. It's one thing to focus on and the rest of it, you know, is sort of like, it's just sort of for atmosphere. And since then, my books, I, I consciously began to, to just pull back on that sense of trying to fill the page. And Thinking likewise with music. Yeah, yeah, I think cinematically. And it was the same with the music, whereas my music initially was incredibly detailed and I just couldn't leave it alone, kept on adding another line, you know, trying to open it up. It's a thing that just comes slowly, I suppose, with, with, with age or maturity. But you talked about um, music uh, in a lot of interviews and sort of the, the rock beginnings. I remember you drumming and yeah. you, but you played a lot of different instruments, but then that rhythm kind of helped the writing in a way. I guess, yeah, it did in, the, in as much as most of my books, probably the majority anyway, uh, are written in verse. And people say, oh, that's like an added level of dif difficulty. But for me, it was the opposite. It was like a security blanket. Writing prose, you know, wh when do you stop? Where do you start? Mm. When do you stop? You know, is, is that enough? Should I say more? If I'm writing in verse, I've got four lines in a stanza. And if that, those four lines don't take the story forward or make a joke or have some purpose, then they're rubbish and they don't make it into the cut. You, so it was a sort of like a self-editing. And it was the rhythm, the flow of, uh, of poetry, which I suppose uh, is, is part of the musicality of, uh, of what I'm doing. Because you have to be conscious of someone reading this out loud to yeah. a child. Yeah, well, um... <laughs> I've recently done a book called The Curse of the Vampire Robot. And I so desperately want it to be like, you know, sort of narrated by, you know, I don't know, some, some great, you know, Scottish comedian who can, who can really get into it, because it's all set in the, in the Scottish Highlands many years from now. So there is a sense of performance about it, but I mean, I'm not that guy. Uh, I'm, ha I'm happy to, to write it and do the colouring in, but somebody else can read them. Yeah, fair enough. So what do you think um, some of the catalysts and sparks have been over time um, in the creation of characters? You know, you've mentioned that ideas can come from anywhere and they're often unexpected, mm. but are there any significant ones you can think of, any particular characters that might have had it's almost interesting always beginnings? Travel that has, has it traditionally just sort of sparked the ideas for me. Um, I, was, I was traveling just an inordinate amount in the first part of my career, sometimes for work, doing book tours, and sometimes just for pleasure. And I knew that every time I went somewhere new, I was gonna come back with an idea for a book. Um, one example was uh, I, I, I'd been working in America doing a, a different, different events and I had a couple of weeks off, so Robin and I just took a plane to, to um, the, the, the Caribbean, as they call it, their Caribbean, and went to um, Martinique, that's what it was, um, and went scuba diving, first time ever. I'm not allowed to go scuba diving. I wasn't allowed to go scuba diving in Australia because I used to get asthma as a kid. And if you get asthma, you're not, not allowed to, to go scuba diving in Australia. But we discovered in other parts of the world, they don't care. <laughs> so we just said, yeah, I'm fine, why not? Sure, go ahead, here you go. Uh, and it was amazing, an incredible experience. I remember being underwater, looking, again, detail, the life upon life and the colour of a coral reef and everything going on. And I, and I turned to Robin, who was under the with me, you know, and I sort of went, oh, 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 oh. and she knew exactly what I'd said. She went like this, because I said, this is the next book. And sure enough, I just got out, out of the water and um, immediately just started drawing. And uh, it became the book, The Sign of the Seahorse. Uh, another example was, we had, we'd been a long-term uh, sort of desire for mine to go to see Angkor Wat, the old temple complex in, in Cambodia. A few years ago, got that chance. Um, again, I knew that'd be a book because that interplay of the of the jungle reclaiming, you know, man's glorious, you know, stone temples and stuff is just delicious. The interplay of, of nature and, and rocks. Um, I didn't know what the story was going to be, and I, I kind of basically wrote it on the way home. <laughs> I just figured out what animals live around that area: tigers, yeah. buffaloes, blah de blah, and then wrote a story about the last king of Angkor Wat in my mind. Uh, so that book you know, came from that, that specific travel experience. I remember talking to you once, I think you'd been to Antarctica. Yeah. And, uh, that was quite an experience. It was, me, it was a very expensive experience. <laughs> Took all the kids <laughs> as well, it just wow. cost a fortune. Um, but it was brilliant, I'd do it again. Um, it was actually from the, the, the tip of 
um, South America across to the Antarctic Peninsula, which is quite, quite a short distance on the map, this big, but it's one of the roughest bits of water in the world. Yeah. And, you know, it was really rough. Um, you'd, you'd get sort of hurled out of, out of our beds at, at night by the waves, boom. But it, once you get into the lee of the peninsula, it's like glass. There's, there's, there's no wind and the water is just fantastic, um, fantastically calm. And one day we'd been down there for about a week and we, it, it, was a, it was a chartered boat. There were 38 of us on this, on this Russian icebreaker. Uh, the captain said, uh, came on the intercom and said, there are killer whales in the area. And he gave us permission to go out in the little Zodiac, you know, rubber boats. Um, and, um, you know, just because we'd done a lot of work landing and stuff. Well, this is with kids. And, and we, so we went out there and suddenly we realised that we weren't just in, a, in, a, in like a three or four killer whales. This was a pot of about 30 or 40 killer whales and we were in four zodiacs just sort of puttering around. And at one point, like, there were three or five, I can't remember, just sort of, which came towards us and we were sort of down here. You could almost touch the water and, and the fins are higher than we were and they were coming straight towards us, you know. And you think, da 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 And then when they're about 20 metres away, whew, under, under the water, and it was so clear, you could see them go past and up the other side. Then one of them circled back and came right up next to the side of the boat that I happened to be on, and right up next to it, and, as, and slowly went past the Zodiac and just turned with his, half his body right out of the water. And you could see his eye, the eyes about you know, like that big, just looking at us like this. And it was just this amazing, um, close you know, interaction with a totally wild, creature. It was inspirational. And, and I thought, oh yeah, there's a book in this. Uh, and I realised the book would be called Eye to Eye, because there was that connection. Mm. I was looking at him, he was looking at me, he or she. And I thought, that's it, because eye to eye has that double meaning of, of also meaning kind of like a, a, a sense of connection. Yes. And so I wrote a book called Eye to Eye. And one of the pages is about, is set underwater. Although in the end, it turned out to be a, a blue whale rather than a killer whale that I drew, just because it was more majestic and colossal and I wanted all that massive deep blueness. But that's where that idea came from. So there's a, a subtle ecological theme, like you don't beat everyone, beat everyone over the head with it, with your books. And sometimes I do actually, well, <laughs> and I've been pilloried for that, but hey. It's, it seems to me that it's, it's, it's all about connecting with the world and that we're all sharing the world. And it, it's definitely like an important message that um, I guess people like David Attenborough and, and others are putting very eloquently. Mm. Are there areas of, um, I guess, natural history, documentaries and all that sort of thing that feed into your work or do you find that you're much more uh, sort of tuned into personal experience? I think it is personal experience. And I also, I don't think of myself at, at, at any level to be a wildlife artist. You see the work of somebody like Robert Bateman or, or, or as you say, the, the, the documentaries of David Attenborough and you realise, well, okay, they are masters at what they do. Um, what I tend to do is think, well, this is, this is a book that first of all has to entertain. Say a book like Uno's Garden or The Waterhole. But for it to for, for it to be worth me spending my time on, I also want to say something useful. Yeah. Now, this is this is what's changed with my with my work over the years. Originally, something like Animalia, or or the Eleventh Hour, I was just having fun, and there was no message. They were just kind of fun puzzle books, or me just trying to show off, you know, that I, I could you know do all this detail and draw stuff. Um, and I think it was only with Sign of the Seahorse I was working on a, on you know that that idea and doing a bit of research, and and I realised there was a. a, a that we were actually losing coral reefs faster than rainforest. And this is years and years ago. So I wanted to include some kind of ecological message in that book. And then with the waterhole, it's about the cycle of seasons and the need to share what is a global resource, water, the most important global resource. Uh, and with Uno's garden, it's a, it's, um, it's a plea for balance uh, between man's needs. Um, and that's, you know, we're part of nature, we're just another animal, but we're a pretty, you know, successful and dominant one. Um, but first of all, yeah, I, I don't, it's, it's no good whacking people over the head with a message. You've got to, you've got to have, entertain them, having fun. And if they, if they sort of get the message under the surface, that's a much better way of doing it. Yeah, that's, I think, communicating more directly. And I think even children are suspicious when they're being sold something or <laughs> yeah. being 
you know, having a message yeah, pushed should, out. They, any, any self-respecting child would run a mile if they thought that they were being sort of, you know, fed a message. You know, you've, you've, they've got to sort of see it. Also, at their own, when they're ready. Uh, again, a book like The Waterhole um, works at many, many levels. Uh, it, it, it's, a very, it's a simple counting book from one to ten. Um, there's, uh, and then there's the, the counting game in reverse, the little frogs that are hidden everywhere, which is the, the counting game in, in reverse, ten to one. And then you move from there into, well, okay, why are all the frogs disappearing? Because the water's disappearing. There's a sort of a cycle of, of, of seasons and then they, they come back. So there's a happy ending. There's a whole lot of other animals to find there. So it becomes, and they're all from different parts of the world. So it's the, there's a natural history lesson there too. And in tiny writing along the freezes and the top at the bottom of, of each page is the name of that animal. So it, there's an educational side to it. But actually, I've, I've just got to tell you this, this, uh, this is one classic example of what I didn't want to do. With Uno's Garden, I was saying before that this is a book about balance uh, but I just, and about how, how it can get out of kilter. If you too many houses, not enough, you know, trees, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, and so there were some simple arith arithmetic sequences, which kind of I used to sort of link that doubling, you know, of the number of houses and slowly, slowly, slowly losing animals and houses and, uh, and, and, and habitat. trees as the habitat, yeah. yeah. Um, and that was good because it was a slow burn. It was still about, you know, just having fun with all these crazy made up animals and so forth. But in America, they wanted to put a big sticker on the front of the book saying, fun math counting book. And I just went, no, I wouldn't buy it. If I was a kid, I'd say, you really? I might just read the one which is gonna be fun. So they, they wanted to spoon feed you know, the idea of the message. And, and I said, that's not the way to do it. But that's a cultural difference, actually. Yeah. Here, we're, yeah. we're happier to let, uh, children, as, as I see it, uh, um, discover and, and work it out for themselves rather than being led to it or dragged to the it. The best lessons are learned through play. And um, mm -hmm. if kids are having fun, it's going to stay with them. Too and right. uh, they'll keep wanting to go back. Absolutely. That's interesting. Um, probably uh, leading into talking about publishing as a business because you've obviously um, worked with publishers for many years and... Uh, there are obligations with that, and there's like a mutual support system going on. Um, uh, it's probably a big question, but how do you think it's changed over time since you've been sort of starting out? And it seemed like such a fantastic, almost lucky break to meet the right people at the right time, have the work at the right time, and then, yeah, it's, it's almost been... Um, momentum since then. I, I was incredibly lucky to, 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 do, to, to be working and starting off when I did. I'm pretty sure that if I, if I pitched Animalia to a publisher today, it wouldn't get accepted um, because it's, it's not well enough directed, you know, far too hard, you know, all these alliterations, little kids. I mean, this is an alphabet book, you know, and it's got things like Victor V. Vulture, the vaudeville ventriloquist, versatile virtuoso of vociferous verbosity, etc. And it was actually, I had a conversation with, with my publisher at the time, Bob Sessions at Penguin Books, who said, oh, it's pretty tough for kids. And I, and I said to him, but it's not, about, it's not about what it means, it's how it sounds. You know, it's, and, and you know, if you don't know what the word vociferous means, we can go and find out. And he went, yeah, I'm with you, good. And so he said, yeah, and we'll do it. But now it's just not that easy. Uh, there, there'll be a whole sort of like, you know, you know, anonymous reading group and, you know, the sort of the committee who decides on titles and everything else. And it just wouldn't get up. It really wouldn't. It would have been watered down. It would have been, it would have been dumbed down, to be honest, um, I think now, because uh, everyone's much more risk averse than, uh, than back in the day. And yet that's probably been a lot of the appeal and the success has come about with these layers that you've been able to incorporate into the books. Well, it, it, the thing is, it's just not talking down to kids. What's the best way of putting off a kid is to, is to put your hands on your knees and say, hello, how are you? You know, mm -hmm. you know or maybe they'd find that amusing, but probably not. It's, you're better off to sort of shoot above their heads and, and encourage them to rise, to jump to the occasion, you know, rather than trying to pitch to where you think they are. You know, you're not going to extend them. And the also, adult view. Yeah, that's, down, yeah, look, that's yeah. what the kind of men, yeah, the no, looking, looking down, down now, children. Yeah. Yeah. 
um, but also it's got to be fun for me too. And whilst I'm still, you know, probably three quarters child, there's a part of me that tries to be grown up and, and, I, and I want to, you know, also re reflect my interests and, and my aspirations and what I think is funny or worth, worth doing and worth saying. Uh, so it's, got to, it's also got to be for me, each book. Yeah, so you're clearly very conscious of your audience, and, but you've mm. also got to keep, um, yeah. keep the publisher happy as well. well. Do you find that, that there's a constraint over time that you're expected to create more and more product of, of um, mm. you know, keep building on success? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, the, the publisher, would, 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 they would they'd kill for another Animalia. Unfortunately, I did all 26 letters, so we're kind of like, the, the sequel just isn't going to happen. But, you know, that sort of thing, you know, it's true, because that's still my, you know, the, the, big, the big sort of book, which I did when I was still 20-something. Mm. And, and, you know, can you do another Animalia? Well, no, not really. Um, it'd be, be nice if there was something that came to me and I was super enthusiastic about it. I, I kind no, of, I kind of would. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, was, I was really happy actually recently. I, I, I did a book, I think I've mentioned before, the, the Curse of the Vampire Robot, and it's all in black and white um, because as a kid, I loved the work of Albert Dürer, his, his amazing, amazing woodcuts, and I wanted to somehow channel that. And I've done a very poor version of it, but enjoyed myself enormously. Point was, though, that um, it, I, I was just thrilled that I've managed to get that through the, the, the publishing kind of, you know, project prevention department to say, it's not gonna have color, it's gonna be black and white guys. And we, we did it, so that was a real win. Yeah. They, they, yeah, yeah. Publishers are not that keen on black and white books because they just don't sort of sit up against color books in, in, the, in, the, in, the, publish, in, in, in the bookstore, in, in the shelves. Yeah, yeah. And Jura is such an interesting influence because one of the first, I guess, Renaissance artists to mm -hmm. depict animals so there's a yeah. connection there, working in the black and white um, with such amazing detail as well. So, yeah, you can see, clearly see the influence. I remember now when the first time I saw there was a, a Dura um, picture of a rhinoceros, um, which looks fantastic. It looks like almost like a sci-fi, you know. It Harold. was drawn from a description. Wasn't exactly. It? He'd never yeah. seen a rhinoceros, but it was in pretty good effort as a, as a result. But I just loved that picture. I had a big blow on my wall for a long time. So, and all of my early work before I uh, went to college and learned a little bit more about colour theory, I was, I was scared of colour and I just you did everything in black and white, either, either line work or dot work. And I had those... Remember the old days? You had these rotaring pens, which were like, you know, technical pens, which would always get blocked up. And you could get the big fat ones and the medium ones and the really, really, really fine ones, which were just hell because they would, point every two time five. you used it, you'd spend 25 minutes just trying to make it work. Yeah. And <laughs> uh, I think I even had a point one. It was just, or maybe it was one too far. Anyway, but you've got this fantastic fineness of detail again that I loved because, you know, I don't think you could even find those pens these days. There's, they've got... I haven't seen a rotary pen Probably for Probably digital decades. versions now. Exactly. It's all digital, isn't it? Yeah. So let's talk about that transition from mm. hand-painted and um, those techniques that you've developed over years and then that... Was it a, a sudden switch to digital or was it a gradual shift? It was almost overnight. Uh, I, was, I was working on... I think it was the waterhole... So I suppose it was, it was a little bit gradual because that was a few, few books before. And, and I was doing all this fine work and I realised that I was doing this, this really weird thing. I was, I was sort of working like this and then working, working, working. And then look, I realised that my eyes were going. I couldn't see what I was doing. So I'd be there and just sort of, it'd be blurred and I'd have to look away to see whether I'd got the lines sort of joined up. Thought, okay, what's going on here? When I started getting glasses, uh, it was just getting worse and worse and worse. And also I got um, RSI, a sort of repetitive strain kind of thing in my wrist. And I was spending, if I wasn't just doing this weird sort of like, you know, sort of duck motion, I was just stopping and just wringing my arm because it was just the pain was shooting up there. I had a friend who was working in the animation business who said, oh, have you tried working on screen? I said, yeah, no, it's rubbish, can't do it. You know, it's terrible. The idea of having a, a pad, a mouse here and a screen there and... He said, no, no, it's, it's better now. You can work directly onto the screen. So I bought myself one of these uh, Wake, Wacom okay. Cintiq mm -hmm. tablets, just a little one. And this is where it was overnight because everything that I had learnt, uh, either, either myself or, or, you know, or through college, um, about how to make images on, on paper 
was instantly transferable to doing the same thing on screen. It was just a different piece of paper and a different stick, but basically doing the same thing. And I remember the very first evening, I just, just drew just something, I just made it up as I went along and thought, I could publish that, you know, that, that, I love this. And uh, it also took a lot of the stress and pressure away. I remember working on pictures and having to make a big decision like, you know, what am I going to do with the sky? Is it going to be a cloudy sky? Is it going to be blue? Am I going to try and get some light effects? And I, I'd be sometimes paralysed by indecision for days, if not weeks, because in the old days, you know, the old technique, I couldn't go back and do it again. This was not oil painting where I could just paint over it. This is watercolour and transparent inks. And what you do, yeah, that's it. it you, know, you, you can't change it. Uh, and of course, digitally, you just go try this, you know, save as, <laughs> try it a different way, you know. And I, so I discovered this whole new uh, sort of relaxed way of working. I could just try stuff and then try new lighting effects. And, and uh, in fact, a whole new palette was opened up to me. Um, and it, I think it actually re-inspired re and regenerated my enthusiasm to, to keep flogging away at this business. So what point was it, um, you said more on, what was the first... Um published piece that you would have done that was purely digital? It was called uh, The uh, the Jewel Fish of Karnak. Um, I'd been to Egypt years before and I always, and I had never done a book about it and uh, suddenly this one sort of came to me. I've always actually rather loved paper engineering. Um, I, 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 and I, I did a book called Enigma, which had a, um, a, a sort of a relockable safe. I'd, I'd done the 11th hour years before, which was a puzzle book, and it had a kind of like a sealed section at the back, cut the seal, and there was all the answers and so forth. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if you could do one where you, after you've got it right, you could close it again, you know, sort of turn the dials. But it all, uh, you know, so the next person had to do the work. Um, and I've, it took probably longer to figure this out than actually do the artwork for the book. But with Enigma, I've, I've figured out this way of doing a, a, a th three layers of... of, of cardboard which was basically built into the back cover of the book which had these turning dials and a little thing it was just it's paper engineering uh, and it was a real problem to be solved and I loved it and I was so happy with that and along the way there was another version of it that didn't quite make the final cut but that became the mechanism at the back of the jewel fish of Karnak where again there's a puzzle to be solved and if you if you turn these dials the, you know the fish and the jewels change until it's you know, you've got the right, you know, the right pattern. So the, that book was actually born out of a, out of a, a paper engineering solution from a yeah. previous book. Yeah. Funny how things happen. And the publishers were happy to go along with that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were. I've been, I've been terribly lucky. Uh, you know, I've, 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 I've put CDs in the back of, of books with way, it was the worst band in the universe very autobiographical, yeah. um, which was after the sign of the seahorse. And I was still trying to kind of like meld my musical interests with art. Mm. And uh, that, I, I remember the conversation. They said, well, look, Graham, if you, if you do all the recording, you know, we'll print the CDs and put them in the back because there was no downloads in those days. It was a CD or nothing. And so that was very generous of the publisher because they had mm. no idea what, you know, what the music was going to turn out like. And they might have regretted it in, 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 uh, in hindsight. But, oh, um, I probably saw the potential in mm, having multimedia packages I that suppose. they could deliver to people. Yeah, it was almost, it had almost never been done before back then. I Certainly saw some the kids photos book. online of some kids dressed up and like they were performing. That the story. worst band in the universe? Yeah. Yeah, no, you did, I did write it as a stage play some years later. I've done it with a few, few of the books. Sign of the Seahorse, Grandma Lived in Gildy Gulch, which was the very first one. Um, Jungle Drums, they've, they've, I've just, again, because of the music. Mm. I've, I've written, actually, I wrote a complete orchestral score for the Sign of the Seahorse. It got played, uh, I think we did eight performances, the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra wow. in, in at the Arts Centre, which was an amazing experience. Nice band. <laughs> uh, but it, it was just too big to fly, you know. Orchestras don't come cheap and, mm -hmm. you know, I'd love to see it up again, but it was fun. Yeah. And a sand sculpture from the Dragon book? Uh, uh, dragons and then Animalia, actually, just yeah. more recently down, down at, um, uh, down on the Mornington Peninsula. Uh, there's a place called the Bonio Maze and they've decided to do a big sort of sand sculpture thing. So they did every page from Animalia. Wow. It was Unfortunately, it was just before COVID. So we sort of launched it, da-da, and about three weeks later, uh, mm -hmm. everything was closed down. I don't know really what happened in the end, but it was, it was good to see. And you got a gig at, at Maya? 
on Christmas, was it? A couple of times, the Maya windows, yeah. yeah. Uh, one was, was it the 11th hour? I think it was. And then uh, Uno's yeah. Garden. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I remember being on the other side as a little kid when we first came out from, from England. You know, mum and dad would take you down and look at the Maya Christmas windows. Do they even still do it? Do they? I hope they do. Well, I think it's... the city's been pretty quiet. Yeah, yeah. Um, but... They'll probably pick up again. This but being year, on the other side of the glass, it was yeah. just amazing. Rather than you know, outside looking in, I was sort of inside looking out. Yeah. So those few childhood dreams yeah. realised. Yeah, I didn't even realise they were dreams, but it was yeah, great yeah. experience. How old were you when you came to Australia? Eight years old. So yeah. old enough to be lured by the, the exotic animals and the, the promise of strange Australian probably, creatures? It probably well, set me off on, on the nature Thing. Mum and Dad were sort of like, you know, you bird, bird watching kind of you know, English, you know, sort of hedgerow yeah, yeah. sort of things. But when we first came to Australia, straight to Melbourne, uh, as soon as we got a car, we'd be going out to the national parks and, and seeing kangaroos and emus, platypus in creeks and things like that. Don't see them often now. Uh, so it often happens if you're new to a, a, an area or a country, you tend to see more of it than, than your friends who've been there all their lives. You know? So within a couple of years, you know, I'd, I'd sort of probably see more of, of Australia than my friends who, who had lived here. Afraid of everything that's going to try and kill you. Well, there is that too, yeah. I, but I was immortal in those days, as all eight-year-old kids are, and it didn't worry me. But there was, uh, I suppose then, uh, an interest in wildlife that then channeled into... The, the first book was My Grandma Lived in Gooley Gulch. Mm. Uh, and that was all Very about Australian. exactly yeah. Australian animals, and I'm sure that was that was me as a child, and it was just channeling those experiences. So, I've got um, some questions here about uh, the actual process of drawing and and creating art, artwork. Um, do you, have you found that your method or your technique has changed over time, or do you find that you can still connect with that? Young Graham, that, that first um, was doing the, the very um, <laughs> fine dots and lines. Yeah, the, the young Graham's in there somewhere, but he just doesn't quite have the eyes or the wrist. Or the, or also, just I suppose, just the, the hunger to, to, just to just keep at it with those, because it was pretty labour intensive yeah. doing those uh, pictures back, back in the day. And as I say, stressful too, because you know, if I got it wrong, I, I couldn't bear the idea of going back and, and doing it again. You know, I, I just, I had to get it right sort of first time. Um, and the digital world is, has, as I was saying earlier, has sort of made me relax into that. But it's still, it's the same, it's the same brain, the same eyes, the same, you know, sense of eye-hand coordination. And also, I've never been really into technique. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I haven't wanted to sort of, you know, um, create a, some kind of you know, signature technique. Any, if my books all look the same, it's just because that's the way they look to me in my head. Yeah. Um, but I've never, I, I, almost the, the idea of, of the interface of, of texture and, and painterliness or, or things like that, or line work, that's, that's an imposition. That's something between me and the idea that I want to get across. I, I, I would like it to be almost in a way sort of flawless, transparent, just like a sheet of glass. Mm. I did a book, um, oh, maybe it was 10 years ago, called Eye to Eye. It was, um, when I'd, I'd done a couple of books uh, with, with, on the Cintiq digitally. And uh, with this one, I really felt as though I'd sort of really got my sort of sense of, uh, of the resolution and the detail just dead right. And some of those pictures um, I'm as happy with as anything I ever did uh, in, with the old pen and ink sort of style. Yeah. And I think it is because it's almost sort of glass-like that you don't sort of sense uh, brushes or, or stuff like that. My, my wife's an artist, she's, she's a painter. And, for her, it's all about that. It's all yeah, about yeah. the texture and, and stuff. And for me, it's not what I want. I just want the idea to come across. Yeah, yeah. Um, but not necessarily photographically. It's because you've got to uh, create characters. You've got to have mm. personality mm. and um, playfulness in the, in the process. But there's a lot of ob obviously um, you know, clear observational skills being translated into the images. The... Um, the digital process, I mean, that, I'm not sure what came first, was, were you working um, with that method before all the animation started? Um, I'm assuming this is like third party involvement, mm. sort of taking your ideas into an animated TV series or right. into the app, or has this been something that you've been um, driving yourself, um, mm. the idea that you had that you wanted to see happen? 
happy to see it happen, but gee, I wasn't going to do it myself. <laughs> like, yeah. I, you know, this, if, if you think that doing, you know, just colouring in is hard, try animation. Mm. Uh, we spent oh, five years of good life trying to just get the TV uh, animated series done. It was it was the sort of like the, the, the most ambitious thing that I think I'd been done in animation in Australia up until that point. Um, I think it was 40 episodes and, and sort of like, there's like eight feature films worth of animation. Had very high aspirations for it and the, the money didn't quite sort of run the distance off in the way. Um, very proud of a lot of it, but I can't say that it, I did it. Uh, you know, it, it was actually a joint production between here, um, a couple of animation studios here, and um, PBS in America and BBC in London. And one of the problems was that everyone had a, you know, the right to say what they thought, what they, you know, it was like, oh, you know, designed by committee. Mm. All the scripts were being sort of written in LA, but being then being critiqued in BBC and everything that LA loved, BBC hated. Ah, <laughs> ah yeah, I thought, no, I don't want to get involved in this sort of business. So, yeah. Uh. So you, you basically had to let that, I, I very that happily that, uh, let them go, go yeah. and um, oh, yeah. yeah, let them make what they will with it. I was involved very in the early sort of like you know idea of cherry picking the, the characters. The important thing about the Animalia TV series is that it had to work internationally, it had to be translatable, and indeed it was. It went into about 150 different territories around the world, so it couldn't be based on the English language because. It's un, it would be untranslatable. Mm. So we just cherry-picked favourite characters, created a kind of a world in which they lived, introduced to kids who sort of come into that world to create the, uh, the dynamic and, and went from there. And, of course, that could be translated into any, any language. And, and with translations, um, I'm assuming the books have been translated into many languages too. All the books? or They have now, yeah. um, about... Seven, eight years ago, um, I was actually invited to go to Beijing as part of the Beijing, Beijing uh, Book Festival and the Australian embassy there has an Australian week um, and they, they, they trot out a, a couple of sort of local lads to, to do interviews and stuff. And I took the chance to meet a couple of publishers over there and one in particular, we just got on like a house on fire instantly. Couldn't understand what they were saying. They couldn't understand me, but we had such fun. Um, and they finished up publishing The Waterhole. No, they'd, they'd already seen The Waterhole and liked it, so they wanted to know, do I have I got anything else? I sure do. <laughs> um, and really now, they, I think every year since then, they've, they've published about three or four of the backlist titles, totaling about 30, and every one of them has been translated into Mandarin. And up until COVID, I was going across every year and doing a, a promotional tour. How does your story sound in Mandarin? Well, they sound great. <laughs> I've got no <laughs> idea what, whether they're, they're good. Actually, I do know they're good translations because they've yeah. used really good, you know, professor sort of university type, you know, well-known poets and things like that to, to, to do the translations. And so the that's ideas been the and the, and the um, mm. rhythm and all that sort of thing would... would I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Because, yeah, the hardest thing in the world to translate is, is poetry, is, you know, because you do have that sense of rhyming. Maybe in some cases they, they haven't done that. I honestly don't know because mm -hmm. it's way beyond anything. I mean, I can say ni hao and, you know, she she and that's it. That's my Chinese, my Mandarin, I should say. Uh, but it's been a great, uh, a great journey uh, doing that. Um, it was just learning a bit more about that country. And bizarrely, the, 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 the town over there that, that we know better than any is Wuhan, where, where the whole sort of COVID thing seems to start from because that's where the publishers are based. So mm. that's like, you know, my home city in, in, in China, which is kind of weird. It's got well known for all the wrong reasons. Mm. And, uh, yeah, because COVID's had a big resurgence there, so... Yeah, well, they've like still got a... Yeah, will be limited for a while to come. But. I'm kind of looking forward to going back to be honest, though, because, I mean, yeah, there's also, you know, like any country in the world, you've got a political sort of country, then you've got the people. And the people are just, they're like us. They're just people with, with kids, and the kids are, you know, start off being shy, and then suddenly they're wanting to ask you everything. And, and the parents, are, you know, you can see when you're doing a book signing, you know, they're hoping that it's going to be a good experience, and the kids are buzzed, and everyone, you know, that's what it's about. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's people, and honestly, the same Every single country in the world, there's so much more which is, which is similar about us than different. So you've developed an app um, based around the, the stories, but it, it's, you've got a new sort of focus on edu the education side of things. Is this for very young children or is it for like a, a yeah. different 
different audience or much the same? I don't know. Um, I, I suppose it's not really it's, targeted. Well, it, it's going into uh, libraries and schools, but then so are the books. Um, and but it's a little bit more sort of focused on on um, language. This is the Animalia mm. you know, one in particular. Um, just using that as a springboard into into language, uh, and I've got to say that in the same way as the Animalia TV series was like you know, somebody else was kind of doing it, and I was having fun playing along. It's been the same. Okay. You know, we use proper educational you know experts who actually know about that stuff. I'm not a teacher, and I've mm. never aspired to be one. And I, I you know, I, I've got some sort of I suppose homegrown ideas on what you know seems to work for kids from experience, but uh, I don't I don't have this, the skill set really to do that. And I don't know. I think <laughs> inadvertently you have been a teacher for a lot of children through these books. Well, I, I don't. Yeah, I suppose the books may, maybe so, but it, I, I've always thought I relied on 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 the adult working with the child. One of the reasons that that it's been important to have layers in the book is so that um, both the, a child and a, a parent or a teacher or a carer or whatever uh, can be getting something out of the book at the same time. You know, as, as, a, as a parent, you know, there's nothing worse than, you know, the kids say, can I read this book again? You go, oh, this one, you know, because it's just so boring. And you try to skip through a page and they go, no, you missed a bit. And no, go back again. Um, and, and yet if there's a book where actually you're getting something out of it, maybe not the same thing, but, you know, you're also enjoying it because you're enjoying the wordplay or some of the visual jokes and stuff. And maybe the little kid isn't getting that. And then the older brother and sisters come and say, oh, I can see it. There it is. There it is. You know, so you've got a family thing going on and yeah. everyone's getting into the book yeah. at the same level. That's got to be the best way to, to engender a love of reading in a very small child is for you to genuinely be enjoying it because they can tell. Yeah. If you're just going through the motions, you know, they're not stupid. And if the, if the older brother or sister is going... Hey, I'm into this. Well, yeah, I like this, don't that I? Qualifies. Yes. It does. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I think you've mentioned you don't read your own books to your own kids or <laughs> in the past. But is it um, what kind of literature? I suppose did you find yourself going through as your kids are growing up? Yeah, I, I didn't Without read the Harry my Potter books. Age yeah, or, yeah, yeah. We we, we we went through all of the Harry Potters. We would we sit in the in the in the sort of you know in the sitting room, which had a little sort of pretend gas fire or you know, gas log fire, and uh, and just read aloud uh, every every single one of the books. My wife and I would sort of take turns doing sort of chapters night by night, and they, even when they were sort of the older ones were getting a bit older, they were still loving it going in there, which was, again, great for the little ease because, you know, they could see that it was a sort of a family thing, you know, mm -hmm. getting out the cookies and the cup of tea and stuff like that. Very British. <laughs> um, but I, I, just, I just couldn't, I couldn't read my own kids, my own books. It just felt weird. You know, yeah, his, yeah. daddy's, you know, book. and be like playing your own just music. A bit, yeah, just a bit. <laughs> <laughs> so they, the, it was funny because you know, they'd go to school and, you know, the, the, the other kids would have much more knowledge of, you know, of, of the various titles than I'd done than my own kids. They're going, what? Dad's done a new book? Oh, didn't even know. <laughs> and for a while, it, it was pretty embarrassing too. Kids go through a stage where it's so kind of cool to have a, a dad that other, other kids know and then it's the worst thing in the world. So embarrassing. Yeah. Now they're just whatever. They don't care. <laughs> oh, they've got their own creative careers. Hell yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So growing up, what were your favourite books? I suppose the first part of my life back in England, it was Enid Blyton, you know, and, you know, and stuff like that, and Rupert Bear and, you know, stuff, Noddy and Big Ears. Um, but I wasn't a great reader. Uh, in fact, I was a very slow reader. I think I was, I was probably, um, well, if not dyslexic, then close to it when I, when I was a kid. Not, not good at reading, and I used to write everything backwards. I had perfect mirror writing, things like that, sort of locked into place. But I was sort of a bit behind the, the eight ball with, with reading in terms of speed. When that I was in, became a challenge, do you think? Yeah. Or I was wasn't that, that aware of it. I was, yeah. I, was a, I was a pretty confident kid. I wasn't sort of, you know, worried about that sort of stuff. And I, I think I sort of just to, used to just... Get get through on you know good 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 luck and timing rather than actual homework or knowledge, um, but when I got to high school, I had a teacher, I, uh, my Latin teacher. That's how old I yeah. am, Latin, um, and he um, uh, had taken a shine to my older brother, who was actually quite a voracious reader. And I was, I, he was base major and I was base minor. That's what they used to call us in those days. They had gowns. It was just, it was like out of Harry Potter, honestly. Yeah. Anyway, um, he said to me, base minor, you'd you'd enjoy this book. And he gave me this 
basically a loaf of bread. It was like this big, that big, you know, huge. It was 1,026 1, pages. The Lord of the Rings, all one book, paperback. Tiny writing. Read that. I so, said, oh, God. You know, and I, I started it, and within a few pages, I was absolutely hooked. And um, over my high school years, I probably read that book. 10 times. Oh, really? I just couldn't get enough of it. And this was way before the films, of course. Yeah, yeah. And I was just absolutely captivated by the, um, the, the world you know, the, and the en enormous visual uh, stimulus that the words had created. I, I knew what everything looked like. And amazingly, when, when the films came out, it was incredibly close yeah. to, to how I had imagined it all. I think they really dug down, because as I said, I knew the books intimately, every dialogue, every, every description. And they had, you know, done the same homework, and it was breathtakingly good. The characters and everything. Peter Jackson was well aware of the pressure of <laughs> yeah. um, getting it right, and yeah, I yeah. believe he did too. Oh, it, was, it was masterly, really. Because there was, there was stories of, of dragons and the kind of mythological um, creatures mm -hmm. and things that um, were around, but probably not as much in terms of, like, special effects were pretty raw. Harry House and then. Um, you know, those sort of yeah. clay models and things like that. So animation was pretty clunky from the um, sci-fi sort of fantasy side of things. Yeah. But I remember in the early, probably sort of late 70s, early 80s, there was a big rise in, in sci-fi illustration. Yeah. Um, Roger Dean and, right. and all these sorts of people. Roger Dean, Rodney Matthews, Chris Voss. Chris yes. Achilleos, all of those guys. I was, yeah, very influenced by them as an artist when I started off. Okay. So... Yeah, just looking, well, talking more about um, influences, who would you say that, were there different influences at different times yeah. in your Yeah, it, it started very much with, with Dura. I mean, I, I, th I wanted to be able to do I wanted to be able to do what he did. Um, and then it was people like, like Roger Dean, who was doing the, you know, the Yes record covers, and Rodney Matthews, less well known, but I thought a wonderful style, and a few other guys, Chris, Chris Foss, Foss. F O W S. Yep. Uh, who did a lot of sci-fi sort of covers and stuff like that, um, and then uh, when I started uh, uh, working in books myself, some of the uh, uh, Australian illustrators, um, um, oh, um, uh, Ron Brooks, Peter Pavey, and then I started going a lot, spending a lot of time in America, and guy, guys like William Joyce um, were, were very influential on me, and um, Chris Van Alsberg. Because mm -hmm. every book that Chris Van Alsberg, you know, did was different. He just reinvented himself with a new technique for every book. Unbelievable. David Weisner, people like that, um, I, I was very inspired by. But it was sort of stuff that I aspired to. Uh, I didn't want to broaden my sort of uh, palette, as, as it were. I just wanted to do, do better. Yeah. <laughs> and those yeah. were the guys who were doing it incredibly well. They kind of set the bar quality-wise. and. Yeah. It was also, too, just a, almost a luxurious period of time when these books were available. Mm. We had little sort of um, new shops like Readings and um, yeah. these sorts of places that were opening up. And Readings just around the corner from Swinburne, I remember going around there and seeing what the latest stuff was. Yeah. And uh, that's continued, but it's a bit more underground now, I suppose. I think it has gone underground. And a lot of those people I mentioned, I just don't even think they're working anymore. I'm, yeah. And they're, you know, I suppose... Maybe there's YouTube videos and... Uh, well, maybe they're doing what I'm doing, just going out and sort of building decks and lifting rocks and finding something else to do. But <laughs> yeah. I... Uh, um, I mean, I, I, just, I just think that I, I was always just driven to, to do what I had in my head. And if I found people who were doing that sort of thing and doing it really, really well, and then I would just say... How are they doing that? You know, I'm, a lot of stuff from Roddy Matthews, I would look at his skies and I realised, how are you doing? Oh, it's this thing called an airbrush. Oh, Whoa, God. got to get one of those. And so, you know, I'd learn how to, you know, just do that just so yeah. I could create the, the ideas in my head. And then a lot of familiar tools like that in Photoshop now that um, people would be using them and not realising yeah, what the origin is. No, that's right. Well, again, it's like those little rotary pens you spend half an hour trying to get the thing to work. You know, same with the airbrush. You'd spend half an hour at the end cleaning it so yeah. that it would work next time you, you, you got the compressor out and attached the air hose. just sounds Don't archaic, doesn't it? Yeah, that's like the days of steam engines and, you know, <laughs> extraordinary how we've managed to make anything at all. Yeah, and then one error or one spill and 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Knock over, knock, over next one. knock over a bottle of ink. <laughs> um, just for the benefit of the students that are watching, um, if you, do you think the, there's some maybe some important considerations they should have before sort of starting out on <laughs> their creative careers? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, I think the most important thing is that it's got to be for you first. Um, I think any artist, if they're, if they're making the mistake of just trying to pick a, a market, pick an age group, you know, pick a topic, I think you've, you're already, you know, already made a mistake. I think it's got to be something that you generally want to do because that's what gets you up in the morning. Um, uh, you know, the passion, passion, there's a lot of words starting with P, passion, persistence, yeah. perseverance, perspiration. But you've also got to have a great slice of luck. Um, if you've got all of those things and if you, if you get up and you work hard and you strike oil, that's all well and good, but you've, you've, just, you've also got to meet the right people, you've got to be somehow in, in the, just the, in the zeitgeist where what you think is great and worthwhile doing is, is so other people agree with you. So you can't, you can't be sure that you're going to um, succeed, but you can be pretty sure you're going to fail unless you're, 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 act, you're honest with yourself. Who would have thought that the world in 1983 needed or wanted another English language alphabet book? You know, there were dozens of them. And yet I just wanted to draw everything. And so I thought, oh, I know, I'll do an alphabet book. I thought about it for 15 seconds and then just started work and it became Animalia. It wasn't the original title, it had a number of really awful titles before it became that. Um, and it just changed my life. And it wasn't because I thought, anyone was really needed a, a weird, another alphabet book or a really weird you know, series of alliterations or that it was gonna sell at all. I just wanted to do it. And that's why it worked. I wasn't talking down to anyone. I wasn't marketing it to anyone. It was me, really honest and raw. So if you could go back in time and talk to your young self that was starting out, would you be full of encouragement and saying, uh, this is the way to go? Or no, get back to the drums and... You go, oh, no, 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 the, 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 world, the world was spared my rock band and that was a very fine thing. Um, no, I, I, again, I was extraordinarily lucky. You know, if, if you get to do what you love and it's your career, um, that's, that's pretty close to, you know, the secret to happiness. Do you think there were times when you probably thought, oh, another book, it's like, you know, thinking ahead. Um, you know, of all the labour that's involved. Well, there you go. That, the, pa you? the passion just gets you started. Yeah. It's the perspiration, the perseverance, you know, the, the, all of those. Seeing it the, through. Yeah, just, you got to hang, you just got to stay with it. And when you first start a, a project, which is going to take you at least a year, two years even, um, yeah, the, the, the enthusiasm doesn't last all the way. you just got to, in the end, knuckle down and just do it. But you, you must... Um have a method where you've got things in place that kind of, you finish the end of the day, but you've got something to look forward to the next day to sort of pick up. Yeah, but it, yeah, the thing is what, what happens, you finish up with a whole series of images and you think one's finished and then you've done five more and you go back and go, nah, I've got to go back and, and bring that okay. one up, you know, we'll balance it and so forth. So, you know, typically, I mean, the old days, I just, I had a studio with all of the artwork around the room on sort of on racks so I could look at all of them at once. That was the whole book. And now, of course, it's on, on screen. But likewise, I can sort of just fang through the book and just, and just sort of just, you know, modulate all the pictures. One of the nice things about writing the text, as well as the artwork, is that I'm not beholden to somebody else's, like, sacred, you know, sacrosanct, finished text. I can keep mod modifying that as I go along as well. So, because a lot of the... Uh, the, the trick, I think, to picture books is, is, is the integration of, of the, the, the image and, and the words. Uh, and they, they, they should integrate, but they, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't stack too much. You never say, if, if you can see that the, you know, the girl's wearing a, a red dress, you don't say she was wearing a red dress. I mean, that's a stupid example, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. the, you know, e each of them should build on each other. And uh, if, you, if you're in charge of both, it makes that process just a little more uh, simpler because you don't have to keep going back and asking permission. Is it okay if we don't say that the girl's wearing a red dress? I just go, nah, not gonna happen. I can see the parallels with cinema and the parallels with um, yeah. uh, songwriting too, in that way that, you know, the music will say something, the lyrics can add something to it, or in cinematography, a silence and 
good expressions Sometimes. and things can uh, mm. can say much more. Totally. Yeah, I think all of these things are very closely interrelated. Yeah, they really are. Mm. Well, thank you so much for your time and for all your words of wisdom and your insights into your <laughs> career. I know you've talked about your work a, a real lot, but so we really appreciate you doing it just one more time That's for a, us. Yeah, because I haven't done it for a while. It's, it's been a pleasure. Okay. It really has. Good to catch up with you. You too.